afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the Digital Food Series 2023. Uh, glad you can join us during this week because it's also a uh, spring break, so a lot of people on vacation. Um, but we have a very uh, good audience, I think, also from last week when we discussed the, the Bula digital platform user case. Um, to introduce, my name is Tiffany Tsui. I am the moderator of the Digital Food Series. I'm a sustainability strategist, consultant, and entrepreneur. Other than co-hosting the Digital Food Platform, I'm also the managing director at the Vertical Farm Institute to develop ultra short chain and sustainable uh, food system for cities. I would like to introduce the digital food team, uh, Dick Fiermann and uh, Bianca von der Haag. So we together developed the, the concept of the digital food uh, series back uh, two years ago to focus on the theme of uh, connect, to connect data, technology, and strategy, and to connect people, ideas, and regions. In uh, starting from last year and also continuing this year, we focus on user cases. So the key question is, how do we unlock the, the true value of sustainability with data and digital transformation? A little recap of our session from last uh, month, which is also related to our topic today. Uh, in the last month's uh, topic, we had the Bula Group to present their digital dashboard uh, solution to be able to trace the entire food chain from farmers to uh, retailers, especially focusing on, for example, large uh, commodity products such as cocoa, grains, and then the role of transparency and data that can play into uh, improving the transparency across um, the supply chain silos, but also helping to understand, for example, CO2 emission. So today, we have a, a very exciting guest from uh, Pets Drones, uh, actually from a different sector. Uh, Pets Drones, we have our speaker, Bram Timons. Bram is the CEO and founder of Pets Drone. And Pets Drone is a very innovative product focusing right now at the horticulture sector. And I'll let Bram to explain more about the solution. Um, an interesting question for our audience today to think about how can we bring innovative solutions using data, uh, robotics, and uh, traceability technology across different sectors. So think about the cross-sectoral uh, synergies between, for example, tomatoes and cocoa storage. So that will be a question we'll come back at the end. Um, Bram, welcome. You are the founder of uh, Pets Drones. How old is Pets till now? Um, yeah, thank you for the intro, uh, Tiffany. Um, Pats is now officially almost five years old. I think it just in a month we'll be uh, five years uh, yeah, in the game, yeah, as they uh, as they say that. Yeah, congratulations. So yeah, you are you. a basically a young startup technologist with uh, yeah. a good business mind. Yourself is a business uh, entrepreneur. Right. Yeah. And then you basically you are bringing in solutions into uh, rather, let's say, the traditional horticulture sector. So we're like to really looking forward to, to hearing yeah. your stories. But to yeah. start, let's have a poll question relating to this sector. Brianka, please uh, bring up the poll question. The Okay, uh, the, the, the title is a little off, but the, the question is, it's a standing your position question, whether the controlled environment agriculture, uh, that including, for example, high-tech greenhouses, where you see a lot in the Netherlands, or the new coming, upcoming sector, like a vertical farming, whether it's only for the rich and well-off um, position, do you agree? Because the, the high cost of implementing technology is such as, Sensors, drones, precision controls, robotics, it all means high cost. So that means the product produced that such as salad greens or strawberries are only accessible to the wealthy. 
or do you disagree that technology such as robotics and data-driven technology growth continue to advance eventually costs will go down and it will benefit the entire agriculture sector so what do you uh, what's your position Brahma can you imagine your position what is your position on this topic is you I working? disagree I disagree no I think it's an interesting uh, statement and 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 I agree that if you look at let's say robotics technologies etc are really focused on high-tech greenhouses eh? and um, um, that has a reason and that has to do with the value per square meter uh, and and of course infrastructure and that kind of uh, things but let's say uh, automation of labor uh, reducing drop damages yeah that's of course most interesting in an environment where you have very high yields uh, the value per square meter is very high but i really believe that uh, i mean greenhouse in, in spain you don't have to heat so that you get off so you you don't need all kinds of complex installations but you can still have a very high tech environment because they still deal with with certain challenges uh, uh, let's say uh, for our case it's a better climate, so also better for the insects to develop year round. And so there's there's other challenges that needs uh, needs addressing. And as I said, from our perspective, yes, a lot of solutions are high value and only for for the rich environments, kind of. But I believe, really believe that parts know everything should be low cost and scalable, so that growers from Uganda to the Netherlands and from Australia to uh, Colombia can uh, can utilize this uh, uh, these kinds of technologies to optimize their uh, yeah. A cultivation process. Great. So uh, please start. Tell us exactly what you do in yeah. Castro. You, you want me to share the presentation already, yes, or do you want to? Yes. Uh, okay, Let's start, start the with the introduction. Yes. Yeah. No, that's. Uh, I think it's a good kick of uh, setting the stage uh, already. Uh, uh, we see the the, uh, the industry kind of. Let me know when you um, confirm and you can see the presentation in full. I think it yes. should be. Yes. Uh, you have to put on presentation mode. Yeah, it's yeah. Now it works. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So uh, yes, once again, uh, I'm one of the founders of uh, of Pots. Pots is a tech company from uh, Delft, the Netherlands. So that's already maybe a little bit of a, a strange take huh, from let's say the traditional companies in uh, in horticulture. We're an outsider, but yes, we're already five years in the business, as you uh, asked already, Tiffany. And what we are doing with Pots is we're bringing let's say high tech solutions, but low cost. Um, yeah. To to Eliminate insecticides actually in such an environment with vision. So that's camera technology with bed like drone solutions. And you'll understand why I say bed like drone solutions in, uh, in a little bit. This is something we're developing for horticulture. That's where we see great potential um, and because of the, the increasing uh, challenges uh, there. But it's definitely something you can bring to other, other industries. And that's also. And a statement, yeah, how to get rid of cacao moth in cacao, eh, in your chocolate bar, kind of. Well, you can even take it to that uh, to that side. Um, let's start with our perspective on, on horticulture. Eh? So what's the problem? Uh, what kind of uh, solutions do we offer? And what kind of business model, which is also different than, let's say, just a transactional uh, uh, business model, eh, as we are often accustomed to, accustomed to. And then we can dive in, into other applications, the future, technologies, uh, trends, etc. Um, and what, what you see in, in horticulture and what's also actually agriculture, a very big challenge is of course that chemical pest control, uh, pesticides, insecticides for insects, they're on the way out. Yeah. This is a given and this is something where growers already have to deal with for a long, long time. And it's now uh, that we have the, the 50% reduction of pesticides by 2030, this is a, a spelling mistake, from the Green Deal. Uh, from the European Union, which is really pressing down on, on growers. Uh, so if they have pests, they can use less and less solutions to tackle the pest. Uh, and the risk of, of damages is becoming yeah, bigger. This is something they have to deal with. And this is a trend that cannot be returned. And that's, of course, for, for good. Uh, that's also the ambition of POTS to, to facilitate that. Uh, and we say yeah, the future of pest control and you can have a lot of insects, you can have molds, you can have viruses, they can be crawling, they can be flying, yeah, whatever. It's going to be biology, biology and technology next to each other. That is how we foresee, let's say, pest management in horticulture, in agriculture. Chemicals are out at some point. We will, we will, yeah, we will stay with mechanical solutions, high-tech solutions, um, but also natural predators or natural compounds that, that can tackle, uh, tackle pests. In that transition that's happening now, there's a lot of challenges for growers. And so um, let's say in the past, 
let's let's put it very bluntly, and I'm I'm not justifying the the, the sector then the industry, but let's say in the past they sprayed something and they didn't see anything for three months. Uh, they were really done for 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 a, a good time. Now with the transition to less and less solutions, solutions need to be more targeted for specific insects. The let's say the the side effects, the collateral damages to beneficials, natural predators should be proven to be minimal eh, or, or let's say zero, making it more, it's much more complex. So that means that for, let's say, for a caterpillar of a butterfly and an, uh, and an aphid or, uh, or, or uh, 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 something similar, you have different solutions that tackle that pest. That means that if you are, let's say, in this ecosystem, which is, of course, not a natural ecosystem, even though there's insects and plants, um, it's going to be a very complex puzzle, a very complex balance in this ecosystem. And say, for example, you have the, the ladybugs, eh, that, 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 uh, the, the larvae that eat, eat the pest. Those are beneficial. You definitely don't want to kill them. An insect comes in that needs to be sprayed because there is no other way. That will also mean you will tackle that pest largely, but you also tackle the thing that you just invested in, the ladybugs, which are keeping other pests in check. You can imagine the complexity there. Hey, in keeping that in a balance, there should be a trade-off working towards the best end result. But with that, with, with let's say, less effective methods, let's say they're, they're becoming weaker and weaker in, in, in a sense, and it also means if you do more frequent applications, which is happening, pests will also build up resistance. I mean, if they don't die, they will build up resistance and have very fast life cycles, huh? generations. So that's a very big risk. And often new solutions are introduced and then after a few seasons, it's not working anymore. Uh, a very big, big risk for this, this industry. And then, of course, yeah, it's, I think this is Europe-wide. This is specifically for the Netherlands also a big issue. Labor. Labor is scarce. In agriculture, this is, uh, this is even, uh, even uh, worse the case. Uh, the, the workforce will decline with almost 30% in about seven years from now. Um, pest control is very time-consuming because you can just not randomly spray. And uh, that's not possible. You need to know or, or put beneficials. You need to know what's going on in my crop. What are my beneficials doing? What is the plan doing? When are the people in the greenhouse? It's a very challenging task. And then you need to do the spraying at certain moments, which are also not attractive eh? in the night or in the very early morning before anyone enters. Well, you can imagine there's quite some challenges that's coming the way of, of the growers. This complexity for the grower itself translates as follows. Eh? Yes, given all these trends that are ongoing that they have to deal with, it becomes more and more important to know when a pest surfaced or when a certain generation of a pest will be in the greenhouse. I mean, a butterfly is not a problem, but the caterpillar is. So it's really important to know when the butterfly is there so that you can plan and prepare for the moment, yeah, they said, let's say, voracious caterpillar comes to life. And these timely interventions are becoming more and more important. If you want to have your solutions, a toolbox that they have to work very well, timing is everything. Well, I already mentioned, okay, this means that pest control is also becoming much more time consuming and there's always a risk of crop damages that's luring. If you miss something, well, your tomatoes can look like this or your, your, your green leaves can look like this, which are eaten, it can wreak havoc. I was talking to a, a grower. This was an ornamental plant, so not something you can eat. Two hectares had a certain insect last year cost 100,000 euros only in damages. Uh, that, that, is, that is five euro per square meter. This is, this is immense. Uh, and then this leaves a lot out the, the cost of labor that he put in there, the resources and uh, natural predators, chemical treatments, etc. So you can imagine if something goes wrong, well, then, then the profit of the grower is eaten away, literally and figuratively. So what is POTS doing? Well, when we started POTS a few years ago, we had a little bit of a crazy idea. You can see it in this video a little bit. This is a propeller, which is not larger than two centimeters. So this is very zoomed in. And what you see here is how we use a propeller to kill a yeah, flying insect. In this, this case, it's a mosquito. What we, I'm a commercial guy, yeah, so I, I study business administration. We are a very R&D oriented company. And what we discovered together is that little drones, and I talk about very little drones, I'll show you in a little bit, um, are capable of er eradicating airborne pests. And why is it interesting? Because a mosquito in itself or a butterfly in itself is not damaging. Eh? Let's say the moth. This is our focus insect, which started with, with the pots. This is the focus for us. But this is not where the problem is. This is just the vector. Uh, a, a butterfly, the moth comes into the greenhouse, starts to reproduce and distribute eggs. 
They don't distribute a few eggs, they distribute hundreds. Eh? So they visit hundreds of plants flying around, putting caterpillars, actually, eh, the damage, the risk of damage in every plant, in every tomato, uh, 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 tomato in every strawberry plant, whatever. Eh? And if you look at the control today, they need to wait for the problem phase. Eh? They can either, uh, either have solutions to control the eggs or the caterpillar. But you know, if you find one egg, if you find one caterpillar, you have loads of them. This is something you want to prevent. The perspective from POTS is we use very small drones to tackle those first early airborne insects, the vectors that need to find each other, male, female, reproduce, distribute the eggs, and keep that at an acceptable level so that pests cannot develop in such a way that it becomes a problem. As zero is an illusion. There's always something coming in or surviving, whatever. At least keep it manageable so that we can help growers to improve yields, eh, so less crop damages, use less spraying, eh, less, less chemicals, and help them save on, yeah, eh, um, um, save on labor, which is yeah, becoming a bit, bit more challenging for them. And therefore, we need to automate this, this process. Well, when we started a few years ago, you see some very uh, techy, uh, early, uh, early ver versions of our technology. Here is the drone, quite big still, but, but 10 by 10 centimeters on the, on the platform. We started at, at Corporate Cress in, uh, I mean, we started at one of, multiple companies, but one of them was Corporate Cress, where they try to grow, where they're growing completely chemical free. And this goes to high end restaurants, these kind of leaves, eh? um, in, in fish uh, dishes, dishes. So it needs to be, needs to be clean, eh? uh, ready to, uh, to eat kind of. But there's also caterpillars coming into this crop and uh, it needs to be uh, controlled. And so a few years ago, when we were just taking off, we started with an ID. We started to focus on this specific test and we took that as a starting point. And what happened, happened a little bit in this, uh, in this process of, let's say, going back and forth, iterating, experimenting, um, that it, a few things, things happened in that process. Huh? So we're working towards this, what you see here. Of course, this is, a, this is already an older picture. It looks a little bit different. Iterating as we go. Uh, but on our way, to the world's first autonomous insect control platform, we discovered some things. Let's first explain what we what we see here. I think it's important. You see here a, a, a picture of a, of a tomato greenhouse. Uh, that, that is food that they produce here. Um, and you see four components. Here we have the, the little drone. That is actually our, our pet uh, that, that goes out at night, chases the insect and controls them. I'm not sure if you can still see my uh, webcam. You can now see my hand with the drone in it, and you can see how small, lightweight, and thus how, yeah, let's say agile it is to, to take out insects. We need to be. But of course, drones are relatively expensive if you put processing power on it, a camera, etc. So we want to do something different. What we decided to do is now we make the drones as cheap, as lightweight, as agile as possible. We put all the intelligence in fixed spots with cameras. And that's where the magic happens. This base station is observing the airspace above the crops, between the crops. That depends on the environment a little bit. And it's observing all the pest insects that are flying around there. Yeah? We do that with infrared because otherwise we cannot see the dark eh, as we are, let's go, chasing uh, a night active, eh, the nocturnal uh, insects. Yeah, but this camera is making sense of everything that moves through the picture. Then puts labels on the insects. We come, we come to that. And then sends the drone into the flight path of the insect to set the eradication with the propellers in motion and to really kill it in air. Sounds a little bit maybe warfare. Maybe it is, but then in small and a little bit more friendly with, with good, good purposes. Um, to make this, of course, autonomous, I already mentioned labor. We need, of course, something to keep this thing running. And that's why we need a charging platform. Right? You, so you can see our, our, our system in this environment is sitting idle on the platform. This is our ideal situation. Then a moth comes in, start to move around. At some point in that life cycle, life cycle, they will pass the system or one of our systems strategically placed, eradicate it, and the life cycle cannot be, let's say, fulfilled. Yeah, yeah. breaking up this life cycle means that it will not come to a certain rate of expansion that, that causes an insect to become pest insect. So how, how does it look in uh, in practice? I have here um, I have some videos from from practice, of course, but this is maybe fun to to show it uh, show it by uh, by day. You see here a camera system. This is one of our colleagues, and he's blowing bubbles like our kids do. <laughs> um, but the system sees them as moths in this case and starts to 
starts to hunt them. Here the drone is sitting, going after the bubbles, and yeah, it's a day demo, uh, but you can see it's cleaning up them. Done comes back and then puts it back on the charging platform. And there it will recharge for a next mission. And so you can see that we can actually hunt these things in air and hunt multiple uh, multiple of them. And so we are uh, we are actually taking them out, uh, yeah, fully uh, fully autonomous. Of course, this is a day demo, and it's a let's say uh, uh, we have light and there's movement and it's a very small environment. But of course, we also bring this to the the greenhouse. But before we we go to some spectacular uh, videos of kills, I want to show this. Um, because one of the things that happened while developing this, this technology, we started to collaborate with, with gerbras. Gerbras is a flower you cannot eat, but, I, but I'll come to, uh, yeah, let's say, to the other crops. And tomato looper, you saw it here in, in the copper grass environment, with the uh, edible leaves, you see it in the gerbras, you see it in tomatoes, bell pepper. You can have them everywhere. Yeah? So this is a very big pest, specifically for the Netherlands or let's say Northwest, Northwest Europe. And Statement here is you can observe a lot by just watching. And we learned that the hard way, or let's say the good way, because we were really focusing on this specific moth, big issue, really messing up, let's say, uh, uh, great pest management programs. Um, and we, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we needed some test locations. Gerbra was very uh, interested uh, in this. So we uh, said, okay, we need four greenhouses. We're going to put the old techie cameras and then start monitoring there. Nothing in challenges, just watching at the videos, uh, what happens there. And what you see then at night is the following. Uh, you see the gerbra heads here. It's, of course, grayscale at night, but you see the butterfly fly. Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. And for us, that was a trigger moment that we said, hey, we now know that there's the pest in this greenhouse. Let's give this grower a call because we want to do testing the coming nights there. Uh, because we know there's the pest. We can do tests there. We bring our drones, we bring our people, and we start iterating with this technology. You can imagine five years in the game, it's a long, long way from the IED to actually selling products that, that work. So we called one of these growers and said, hey, we see now quite some moth activity in your greenhouse. Can we come and test? Well, the grower was super happy. He said, yes, we are ready for this. Hey, come in, you're welcome. But um, how do you know we have the best? And we were a little bit surprised, taken aback. and said, well, we see them flying, don't you? And they said, well, no, we have traps uh, with, with lures for the, for, the, for the males that go for the female pheromones. We have UV traps. We check the crops for caterpillars and, and egg deposition. Well, we haven't seen anything. Oh, okay. We didn't put too much attention to it because we did not see this as a monitoring system in itself. But the next day, the, these other growers, they talk to each other. They're in some certain uh, WhatsApp group in the Netherlands or something. Uh, uh, and they share best practices. And one of the other growers called and said, hey, I also have such a camera in my greenhouse from you. Um, I also want this data, which the other grower gets. And we're a little bit taken aback again. I said, yeah, but we don't really have data. We just checked the videos. Well, you better make data of it because this is very important for us. This is serious, uh, serious business. And then together with the growers, some advisors that do the, the cultivation and the crop protection, and they guide them kind of. They started to pour jackets and really pushed us. So I'm really like, hey, come on, let's build something that we can actually use to plan better the tools that we're using, let's say the crop protection solutions we have to plan better and, and intervene better. Because apparently we were able to see the pest weeks earlier than the grower would, would do. And that's of course very valuable because that means that the pest is already there and you can already control it before it escalates, which they now typically would see without, without our system. And so the interesting thing is from something we did not expect we were able to market already the first solution. There's also part of the, the startup uh, journey, I would, I would say. We had something, we're sitting on something, and we did not know that it had value. Uh, and now we have a system. It's the first system, uh, which we're building a modular ecosystem, you could say. The first system that saves growers in tomatoes and strawberries and in, in plants, flowers, and that can help them monitor this pressure daily. So we monitor every night, every hour, every minute. There's already much more than they are able to do with, with the physical traps they have today and save them hours. But it also allows them to, to, to intervene much earlier and prevent worse, worse. Now, growers need to interpret this data also still from our side. We can do some, some, let's say, predictions, but we really believe we can actually do 
accurate predictions. Because in the end, it's a life cycle. You also know a baby will take about nine, nine months to, uh, to grow in the belly and then comes out. Eh? You can also see that with insects. This means that you can really say, hey, from the first pressure that we see, we can now estimate when the caterpillar will rise and when, let's say, the least harmful solution so the green alternative should be applied for maximum effect of the first hit of that of that caterpillar yeah, that is otherwise eating away your your plant, your fruit, whatever. And so really moving already towards a vision support system. And not only in these crops, you can apply this in any environment. Yeah? In greenhouses, at some point also in agriculture, we have some tests running outside, even in warehouses where, let's say, edible goods are stored. You can use it anywhere. And so... Taking a completely new perspective eh, from a tech company not home to horticulture, we see that technology is something that is very scalable. Eh, well, normally, if you introduce an, an insecticide, well, that takes already 14 years eh, from, from first compound, found compound to introducing it and marketing it. Um, but it's also very targeted certain crops, certain geographies, certain insects. We don't have this limitation. Of course, it's a lot of work to build this model and, and insect profiles and AI and everything. Eh? Because, yeah, there's thousands of insects flying. Which one are the mods? Which mods is it? Or what, what other insects can you see? Eh? But, but that development, that is software, you can do that kind of from your desk. Update it and it's available. Independent of borders. And that is, I think, the big promise of these kinds of technologies for these kinds of challenges that you'll, that you'll find. Some other, um, I have some other examples uh, just to get a little bit of uh, impression what we see in the greenhouse. Well, we, we are just taking samples of small parts of hectares, uh, you could say, or thousands of square meters. But those samples say already a lot about what's happening in the, in the greenhouse. Is the pest present? And did it arrive? Trigger moment for a grower. Um, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? They can evaluate their, 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 their spraying regimes or, or the solutions they use. And so we're bringing actually data to the grower to optimize the integrated pest management process, as they call it in horticulture and agriculture. So it's like a completely new way of looking at, uh, at things. And yeah, you can do it in tomatoes. You can do it in strawberries. Most fun for us is, of course, to do tests in strawberries because it smells nice. And well, sometimes you can eat one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really nice. But of course, monitoring only helps to utilize the toolbox that they still have more targeted uh, or let's say more efficient. But they still need to use the old tools to fix it. And they are rapidly declining. We are still after the big impact. And we're making quite some, uh, some progress uh, with that. And because the, the POTS X, that's actually an extra expansion. Uh, same camera, uh, same, uh, same uh, module to look into the dark but then we put a drone next to it. And so growers can also yeah, elaborate on the system as they go, get more trust, et cetera. This thing is taking out the mods in flight. And so the system controls the adults automatically. No humans involved. So what we do with this, we prevent crop damage at the source. If we can tackle an adult, male or female, we can prevent much worse. And of course, yeah, we're doing it in a mechanical way. So... It's residue free. That's quite obvious. I hope the video is running smooth, but these are some, uh, some videos from practice, some environments. Um, and here you see, uh, let's say, the, the, the PATX insect control left. You see the environment of corporate grass, which you saw much earlier with the green uh, edible leaves. On the right side, it's the same image. I can play it twice. There's also a slow mo um, where you can really see what's happening. And in the green circle, there's a drone. The moth is coming up in the left upper corner. That's it. One second, a little bit more. But gone. This one is intercepted. This was a confirmed kill. Went maybe a little bit too fast, so let's play it a little bit slower. And if you look right, we look at the movement of the image, and you see the drone taking off, going up to the white blob, which we know is a moth, and then corrects in air for the flight path of the insect. So we're not shooting a bullet. We're really... Uh, aiming for it and correcting in this one and a half seconds that we have to take them out. Yes, it's more visual uh, than, than controlling caterpillars, but you can imagine you only need to control a few moths rather than killing off hundreds or maybe thousands of caterpillars in the greenhouse. So, I mean, yeah, still you need to kill insects, but at least it's much more friendly and you have to kill much less of them. Uh, and um, yeah, so so... 
what what's happening now is where where normally a grower would say, hey, um, I know these problems I have. I fill up my cupboard with certain solutions. I plan together with my we make a, some kind of calendar. Of course, they just as they go because sometimes now it's quite a warm winter, so pests rise earlier. Uh, beneficials can only put, put from April on, so they need to to tweak that throughout the year. But growers will now be moving much more from, let's say, the hours they spend and liters of of active ingredients they use or solution. They really go to a business model where service is becoming more and more important. This is happening. This is already happening with the traditional suppliers, but especially with technology, growers get service and the outcome rather than the input that they measure. And then, uh, okay, so many liters of that, so many, I can apply that three times a year for, uh, following legislation. Now we're moving towards a situation where we look for the best end result with minimum, with the least input possible. Uh, so that means automated pest monitoring and control using technology. And it also means that your business model changes. Not a one-time fee and then you buy it and, and goodbye. No, you take this growing development off. Because you can imagine, as we go, as our infrastructure grows, much more cameras, we can do other things, look at other uh, pests, we can monitor the bumblebees, which are yeah, needed for pollination, for example, of, of tomato. But you can also update and say, hey, we can now take out other pest insects. If you do that in a, in a good way, the whole ecosystem in the greenhouse will work better because you leave the bumblebees alone, you leave the ladybugs alone, the natural predators. We only take out those annoying insects that 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 yeah mess up your system kind of and and yeah cause uh, cause damage in the in the process. Um, one big pest that we are now addressing, maybe not so familiar for you, eh, the audience, but the banana moth, we, we see it in the Netherlands and tropical plants, but you'll find it in, in banana, you find it in kind, all kinds of tropical plants, eh, where also food is produced. Now, that moth is quite susceptible to our drones. I, I show a few videos eh, to, to, uh, yeah, to demonstrate it a few times to you more. Same uh, images, eh, moth is coming in, and then the drone starts to chase it. Yeah, first I misses it, and then it does some catching, uh, catching of it, and then then shreds it. And this is what we're doing constantly. So imagine multiple of these systems uh, in a certain environment, constantly taking out fa yeah, vectors of pests that we take out to prevent further uh, further development. Uh, and, and sometimes it's a flight of two seconds, sometimes one second, but they're uh, typically very short. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, and that's important because insects can also be quite fast fast flyers. Well, what's then the business model behind this? I already uh, mentioned a little bit. We are taking growers on a journey uh, because we start with the first growers. We start just with monitoring as something they could buy. Now it's the first growers that, that understand, that trust us, that see how important technology becomes in this process where you can take them on the ride and start to develop the drones uh, or provide them the drones for certain pests. Um, provide other monitoring solutions for the smaller insects that you cannot see in the air yeah, or that are on the plant or that's so small that will not fly that high. Yeah, so like the white fly or trips of aphids. And yeah, so really building, yeah, providing building blocks at the lowest price possible to help them through the cultivation cycle in the most clean and most efficient, uh, efficient way. And that means, yeah, gathering data yeah, and the data then translating, of course, to useful insights and advices that's a little bit more long term there's a lot of yeah you need to model things you need ai to classify insects and discriminate eh? from the whole bunch of insects you can see in a night sometimes thousands eh? which you need to discriminate one from another and then of course expand with the drones to take out those that you don't want there eh? and and i think one of the important things here is that we learn and, and there are a lot of growers already yeah, get their ideas from is looking, starting with the point from the behavior of the insect, yeah, rather than this is how we normally work between nine and five. We do the spraying uh, that day on that time. You now look at the insect. Take the pest, yeah, take that as a starting point. And this is a, a typical uh, um, example. This is a one, one, one month of monitoring data last October certain situation, a certain moth. And you see in green the hours that the system is on. So typically between six and seven in the morning, it's dark, moths are active, then we are monitoring and sometimes also uh, some growers also controlling. And if you ask this grower and would say, okay, how are you doing your treatments now? They would say against the adults as well, they would say, yeah, we use our system 
to, to take out airborne insects. And we, we activate it when everybody leaves the greenhouse around five, six in the evening. Then put kind of mist in the greenhouse to kill them off. And then stop doing that around 11 in the night. And then air out the greenhouse so that the next day people can safely enter. Uh, these are, there's a law, laws and regulations for that, regulations for that, how to do that. But if you look at the, that the behavior of this specific pest, it's flying at a completely different time than the grower thinks. This pest is quite, let's say, this differs from one to the other, even within the class of monster differences and between insects there's a difference. But this pest is most susceptible between three, two and four in the night. So uh, taking that as a starting point, this grower decided, okay, I'm, I'm changing my regime uh, of how I do things, follow the data in my applications. That means that if you do something, it will also have a better end result, meaning you have less escalations, and in the end, you will use less solutions. Eh? Even if it's, if it's biological, if it's chemical or something in between, it will mean less resources, less input in the process, better results. Uh, and we think this is really, really important. Know what you're doing. Data is definitely yeah, going to help big time, big time with that. Maybe we can take a little break, uh, Bram. I think uh, yeah, sure. to have, uh, on the topic of IPMs and data, um, yeah. because that's really the key question we would like to answer is indeed, is the role of data and digital technologies in the greater, the broader uh, transformation of the green goals, for example, in EU, and yeah. also how it can connect with the existing ecosystem because there was a really, really we are completely captivated by your story of this discovery of uh, how uh, that you discover insect behavior that you, is not known to you and actually not known to the growers who been who has been working in a sector for years and years yeah, yeah. so that's for advisors uh, the big companies yes. correct yeah. So that's also a, a, a very nice example that when you take technology development as a holistic approach, taking this whole ecosystem approach, so it's not about individual expensive uh, novel applications, it really needs to be taken into account of how you work with, you know, with taking a kind of an outsider point of view. You may be yeah. fascinated by this Star Wars kind of analogy, shooting <laughs> shooting airplanes in mid-air. That probably yeah, might yeah. be you are one of your inspirations outsider, but bring yeah. that into a traditional sector, but working also with existing knowledge that's really, yeah. really powerful that yeah. also can mean further um you know, integration with other existing technologies like uh farm management, data dashboard. And yeah. also fertigation, so that it can be really having a, a, a in the, in the, when technology develop further, it will eventually benefit the uh, entire sector. Yeah, correct, correct. So let's maybe look at the the coming back to the, our first poll question. Maybe uh, Bianca can see our the result of uh, if you change your mind, you have your position on our first poll question after uh, Brahms' uh, passionate presentation. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So we have uh sixty percent of uh people in the agreeing taking a more holistic view about technology development in general. And good. So let's look at the second question, which is relating to your um topics already you already touched upon. Is the yeah. impact if you're taking a broader society um, goal and role to look at how this technology coming from you as a um, novel niche application, how that tied to a greater or the broader agriculture sector and then relating to a topic, for example, uh, EU Green Deal goals of uh, zero pesticide target. So this is a poll question. What do you think, how important is the role of data and digital technologies in supporting this uh, wider goals? Um, what do you think uh, about this topic? Is EU doing enough in this area? Or do you think uh, right now there's uh, enough incorporation in this in this topic? No, I think they're, they are doing a lot and they, they also invest in that. Huh? I mean, it's not that they are uh, yeah, uh, leaning back kind of and uh, just put up uh, some new rules and, and, and regulations. Okay, we're going to work towards this. Now they're actually making budget available. Mm -hmm. And you also see that, of course, depends on the face of your company and the traction and whatever and what kind of topic on the on the agenda you uh, you touch upon uh, but you really see that in this field of, of uh, pesticide reduction they're going they're going quite big uh, and there there's all kinds of, of funds where let's say if investors lack 
Yeah, because the, the I take one example. You, maybe you know the ESC Accelerator. That's a billion fund for startups, scale ups. Uh, let's say a little bit like uh, like us with specific themes. And one of these themes is indeed, yeah, let's say a sustainable uh, agriculture practice and horticulture practice, which is also reducing reducing pesticides. And you can really see that they address about I think uh, 100, 200 million for startups only. And we're now talking about startups only. Can you imagine? How much investment there is available for 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 bigger, let's say SMEs, or for for corporates, or for research groups, and you see that all around that there's new research, there's new technologies, new development that they that they um, support, and think that the the the, the let's say the, the Green Deal goals they're challenging, very challenging, but you always need a challenge to solve something because if you make it easy. And let's say, okay, we reduce the use with 1% a year for the coming 100 years, and then yeah, then we're there. You make it too easy. It needs to hurt a little bit to make this, I've got to make this push. Yeah? And and or pull actually. Yeah? So if you decline the availability, growers will automatically to start look around at farmers because they need something else to fill this gap. And growers are not fond of spraying. Yeah? So <laughs> let's get it out of the question. Mm-hmm. They are looking for the solution. And for them, uh, because you mentioned horticulture is con- conventional, um, of conservative, um, I, I disagree also a little bit with it. Yes, but if you can solve it, they will adopt anything. Uh, as of course, the the investment should justify what it brings and what saves them. But but I mean, I already mentioned the 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 the, the example where it loses fifty uh, thousand hectares in one year due to one pest. Well, you can you can develop quite some sensors or technology for that money and solve the problem. So when the need is there, when the push is there, when the pressure is there, and I think the EU is doing that very well uh, in, in this uh, thing, top down with regulation, uh, funding bottom up, yeah, then then you will actually uh, actually get there. And actually, I, I even believe that the 50% reduction, <laughs> I think they will ramp it up a little bit in a few years. Eh? If they see that there is a shift coming, I think they will even increase it and make it even tighter. Great, great to hear. So, uh, um, also like to maybe in your presentation follow on to also highlight on this kind of policy uh, directions. Please sorry, uh, continue. Uh, so oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. So let's oh, yeah. continue. Yeah, on our discussion. Yeah, yeah no, the, I, I, I just wanted to show show one one example here um, of what we see see in practice with a certain moth pest in a certain crop. That doesn't really matter here, but here we're looking at. Plotting the adult activity, just one one phase for the grower, but saying saying a lot. You measure the flights here, and and what you really see is that with this data, by looking every day, every hour, every minute, you get insights that you do not get with current practice when they check once in two weeks. I mean, how are you gonna look at trends if you have such a big interval? Uh, I mean, two weeks in a, in a human's lifetime is not so much. In an insect lifetime, it's forty percent of their existence. So in 40% of the time, a lot of things can change. I mean, it happens quite often. A grower checks, two weeks later checks, and then a certain explosion has happened in the meantime. Somewhere between that, something happened. And really important to be right on the spot there. I'm showing this example where you see, uh, I put a five and a four there. This is a generation five and four. And I can, can tell you, if you see in this greenhouse, 600 moth as five camera systems, which you look just at 5% of the whole surface or 1% of the whole surface, then you know you're in big trouble uh, with this sample uh, sample size. But you see, it doesn't start there. Uh, um, if you go one generation back, that's five weeks on, about the life cycle. You see it's only half of it. But even before that, it started already. So let's zoom in on, on here. Here you can really see, oh, I'm trying to get to the news next slide, but yeah, uh, that's, so the fourth generation, 300, 400 at night. Here we see 30, 40. In five weeks' time, this pest this pen went, went t- times 10 in, in adult activity. That means also times 10 in caterpillars and crop damages. And this is where a grower typically will notice. But this is in June. But you can already see that, in, that before that five weeks, there was already another spike. And then it started with just a few. And here, most growers would say, well, I see on 50,000 square meters, you have seen uh, zero to five moths uh, a night, eh? Eh? monitoring for 10 hours straight. That's nothing. I don't need to do anything. But yes, this is the whole starting point of escalation that is, yeah, that is in the making. And I think it's this, 
this realization, uh, and let's say the grower this definitely misses this and often misses this cycle. That is, I think, is going to be huge uh, if you if you want to do integrated pest management in a good and effective way. Best outcome for let's say people plan a profit, but also for the grower. Uh, so data uh, and then one of us, the poll, of course, is going to be vital. Uh, it's going to help automate laborious tasks. We have a very scarcity of people in the EU, so it's very important. Using high frequency, you can really see new patterns and insights that you can help tweak your program and just the effectivity, and you can get new insights. You can learn things that were never known, even not by the most skilled advisors or suppliers of solutions, but completely change the game and how you do things. Um, and that is really important for evaluating your actions. And not saying, okay, we use a calendar and we spray. No, we're now going to use the data, drive on this, and use that as a starting starting point. And and, and I already uh, already mentioned, uh, and it was also in the title of the of the webinar, of course, yeah, how to get rid of uh, uh, how to control cacao moth in a, in a sustainable way. What's happening in horticulture? It's happening in a lot of environments with edible goods, uh, and in this case, it's also moth. Uh, but you see the the big bags with cacao beans in it, there's a cacao moth. In rice, there's a there's a rice moth. In flour, there's a flour moth. In you can imagine every every edible product, even cotton and tobacco, for example, which you cannot eat, yeah, but, but anything that you could digest in some way brings pests. How are they solving it today? Well, a little bit similar to, to horticulture. They, they monitor once a week, once in three weeks, and then ah, it's now over our threshold. We're going to fumigate the whole environment. Fumigate is just chemicals. Yeah, and that's being used in such an environment. This means that both moths and fumigation will eventually end up in your food, in your chocolate bar. Well, this is, the, this is practice. Huh? This, is, this is what's happening. We have, to, we have to deal with it. But it's something that needs to change. Huh? Because it's all these kinds of industries that are now using methods that will not be there anymore in five years, or let's say seven years. Not in the same, not in the same way. These industries, huh? these providers, will go to a huge shift, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah, controlling these kinds of insects. And here you can see. So next time you buy a chocolate bar, I hope, don't hope I, I scared you for those that are chocolate lovers. Uh, but you can see how many of these moths are flying. And this is, of course, peak activity. And we're looking at a very small part of this 10,000 square meter warehouse. And there's tens of these on this terrain. And so remember next time when you when you buy a chocolate bar that you have some other um, um, uh, proteins that you'll take uh, take in. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when you yeah, when you when you digest that, and so these technologies, and I think I already mentioned the start of the of the uh, of the presentation. I really believe that new technologies, data collection, they can break to barriers, they can break to borders, they can apply it, be applied everywhere. And where most solutions, let's say you have a, a natural predator today, which works very well in tomatoes in the Netherlands, you're not going to bring it to Australia, you're not going to bring it to the US because it's not native. So you need to find a new natural predator. Years and years of development, sometimes tens of years, eh, before you find something. Those cycles, and we are in a hurry. Eh? With, uh, with EU, we're globally in a hurry, finding new solutions. They're not going to be ready for, uh, for all these things. And, and the same goes, uh, of course, for, uh, for, for chemicals. Well, before you are through all this legislation, can, uh, you have to be very patient. Uh, we're talking to uh, a chemical company, and they said, well, to get one product to market, out of a lot that we select in the first for a certain pest, it takes 400 million euros to bring it to the market. And it takes 14 years. Well, if you think about those numbers, what you can do with all that money and to look at new solutions, well, I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm really triggered and I got a, really, a lot of energy yeah, to, to, to look at this, uh, this problem and, and further develop, develop solutions, uh, solutions for that. Um, yeah, so... What, what does the future look like? Well, I, what I already mentioned, it's going to be biology, natural predators, um, um, natural compounds uh, that you can find, and technology going hand in hand. Uh, they can work next to each other. Biology and, and chemicals don't work together. That is now inflicting on each other. This will work. But how do we get there? Well, if you look from our perspective, we're a young company. We know a lot from certain insects, but we also know a lot not. And we don't know how markets work. I mean, if you go to a horty, uh, horty business, you can do business with the grower. But if you go to a warehouse, you need to go through a provider that's doing the pest control. 
to make an impact globally, we need to partner up. We need partners yeah, that, that understand the opportunity, but also the, 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 the challenge that is there. And that means that you have to change business models. And that is, of course, not lightly taken because, uh, let's say, a provider in, 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 in storage of cacao says, yeah, I now invoice hours. How am I going to do that with your technology? Yes, you're not. Then I cannot do this because it will eat away my business model. And so we have to break through this, let's say, a, a sturdiness kind of, of, of looking, at, looking at things, partner up with those that are open to it and with those together, which have that vision, that have that vision, you can start to win the market for you. And you need to do this in every market, in every industry, in every segment, one by one. I mean, if, if we go to France and we say, hey, we have this great solution, works perfect for Dutch tomato growers. You're also a tomato grower. You also have this pest. They will want to see it, how it works in France with their peers. This is something you have to deal with, yeah, but it's really important to speed that up and work with partners because as a small company, we're now 12 people. Of course, we are ambitious, but we cannot scale to 1,000 in two years because that's, that's unhealthy, obviously. So you need to go through partners and work on this together. They are there and we collaborate with some, but we need to grow this network to make this global solutions, globally accepted and adoptable solutions, not only in the high-tech greenhouses in Northwest Europe or Canada or wherever you find them, now, also in the low tech, and that was on your first poll question, this technology should also wor work at some point in, uh, in storage in, uh, let's say, in Ethiopia, in the harbor. Uh, we have systems running in Uganda, completely different, different uh, environment. Um, in America, where it's just plastic greenhouses, uh, yields are 10 times lower per square meter. But still, the challenge of the pests, which is becoming more and more fierce, especially with, with the seasons, yeah, that will need will need that will that will need new solutions that are scalable, easily adoptable, and yeah, let's say affordable. And this is the quest we are on. And there's of course a lot of things that you need. You need money to do this, but there's a lot of money. You need partners, and you need customers that are ready to do it. But for that, it's really important that this pressure is there from consumers bottom up, and from uh, legislation, uh, Europe, national bodies, local bodies, top down. That will all be needed. All those powers will be needed to make this transition and this uh, the shift towards, let's say, cleaner pest control and clean products, ending up eventually in your uh, in your stomach, feeding your uh, on a daily uh, daily basis. So, With that, I want to end my presentations and yeah, hope. Great. <laughs> Maybe it was a lot, but uh, <laughs> to take in. But I hope you liked it. Uh. I love it. We love it. I think it's it's a great presentation, Bram. It's also uh, really uh, very excited to hear your conclusion. That that's also the reason why we set up the digital food platform in the very beginning. Is indeed try to make connections across the sectors yeah. because the agro food sectors, uh, horticulture is part of agro food. But we all know yeah. that the, the silo within the, the agro-food world is quite uh, steep. So the sectors do not really, or not very easily can exchange solutions or have a common standard. So it's a very interesting indeed question. For example, indeed, how do you apply this technology? First of all, within horticulture, for example, by integrating with other control technologies on fertigation, on weather data, for example, and then how do you then potentially apply it to other sector like the cocoa sector? We have also our audience already from Arion from the hook asking, can you use such system in the livestock stock, uh, barns? So I think it's we can open up our discussion to everybody. And I'd like to also hear indeed to answer some of your questions. What's needed to, uh, what are the challenges, opportunities to upscale it? to within your own niche area, but then also to build uh, uh, cross-sectoral solutions for other sectors, and then yep. also on the international level. So this technology, you in order to bring it to Nigeria, to China, <laughs> so not just the, the, the rich countries, yep. but then you yep. also need then educated young people eager to join the sector in other developing lands. So that's a lot of uh, yep. opportunity challenges. I'd like to open up the discussion for that. So yeah. like maybe invite, so feel free to join in, raise your hand, open up your your camera so we can see you and uh, just jump in. And maybe yeah. like to ask, uh, invite Aryan then to uh, introduce yourself and where do you see the opportunities? 
Hello, you have to switch on your microphone. You're a little bit uh, in the spotlight. Yeah, it's good. To unmute yourself. Yeah, there we are. There we are. Uh, well, we're working in the in the fish business, and flies are quite a problem in the, in barns. They touch for they transmit uh, uh, all kinds of diseases, uh, and they're now being uh, being destroyed with chemicals. If you can use such a system, uh, it works like we showed, and uh, that would be quite a step. But I, I'm not sure if that's possible. Well, I think eventually, uh, eventually, yes. Eh? So that's always the the challenge. How easy can you copy it? This phase of the company to another industry, and uh, from moth to moth, it's easy. Uh, but we get this question quite a lot, even during horticultural fair. So that is uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's interesting. And I think at some point this will be will be possible. Eh? Of course, it means investment in in developing solutions for different kinds of insects. So to, to give one of the biggest challenges, we're working on this also in horticulture is. Now, if you monitor at night, you can control your light circumstances. You full control. Uh, you saw it in the images. Nothing else is moving. There's no shadows. There's no people. So you can you can do it. it those greenhouses that you saw on the videos are pitch black. You cannot see. I mean, you can hardly see uh, one meter ahead. If you go to a situation on the day, and I think those flies are mainly active on the day eh, that you're talking uh, talking about, uh, Arjan. Yeah, you need to do other things. You need to enhance your technology. Or at least your software, and because it's still the same camera, but you have to make sure okay, there's pigs moving, and now the full instead of that you see only the lighted part, you see everything down moving. There's insects, there's shadows, there's people, there's wind blowing, there's maybe some leaves. I don't know what what, what can pass, and you have to further iterate on that. Make sure you can do that on the day. Uh, we try and do that horticulture in bumblebees that are day active, but you have to make adjustment to it, quite some, and then, okay, also be able to label those insects. And I think you will only have a few that, that come in, so that is, yeah, you can you can use different characteristics that you will see there to train your models, to make your insect classification, uh, um, uh, IDs, I would say, profiles. Um, and if you want to control, yeah, then it's, of course, important to see, okay, um, how effective can it be against a certain insect? Is it big enough to have enough space to, to fly? So, for example, if you have very small insects in horticulture, white fly probably doesn't ring a bell, but it's very small, like, like this. Yeah, it's really hard to see it three meters ahead. Even as a human, you cannot see it. But if, if it's flying one meter in front, yeah, that's easy. You can see it. But for a drone, flying in front means very little maneuver. It's for your, yourself. You're focused on your, your, your laptop around that you cannot see. If you look ahead, you can see much more. And it's the same for the drone. So you need to... to I also think new technology-oriented solutions for different challenges. Yes, this, will work, this system will work for, let's say, the larger insects, five millimeters and up. But under that, you, know, you will need other solutions or for some pests, it will not be possible because they have certain behaviors that you cannot intercept. And so... You have a lot of directions that you can and should go, um, and we cannot do that alone, obviously. Uh, there will be other startups that hopefully uh, stand up soon and do the same or similar things, but then in different novel ways. Okay. I think the flies are big enough, uh, as you described. No, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's the, 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 the horizontal article, uh, I think, and uh, no, just uh, the normal... Uh, Normal, normal fly, or at least a normal barn fly, let me put it that way. Uh, yeah. uh, and there are quite a few uh, rest times in the, in the barn and that nobody's there other than the animals and they uh, rest yeah. for most of them. But of course, there are always some animals moving around, so we have to take it. Yeah. No, no, exactly. So you have to, to make adjustments for it. It's not impossible. It's more like okay, when do you invest on that and start developing there? Um, the, the, the challenge between a startup is that you're very ambitious, but you also need to keep focus in some yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, uh, I know. I know. Uh, it's a trade off I don't like, actually, but uh, because it gets me enthusiastic already. But uh, yeah, it's what it is. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Ayan. So we have uh, also a number of uh, uh, our uh, from Buller. They were very enthusiastic during the session last time we mentioned your technology. I wonder if uh, anyone from um, Buller can, can actually join today. 
not so sure about if you are, please join in. But uh, Brom, you already showed some footage of in the cocoa greenhouses. Eh? No, so no. that's actually, if you talk about the whole supply chain issue, indeed the storage part, is it's an important one. So what if you're just now looking at what you know now, and then the challenge of uh, moving from one sector to the other, what do you think would be needed to bring this te technology, for example, to have a pilot with a builder in their warehouses? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's very straightforward. Yeah? So it's a very non-invasive product, you could say. It's not, they, 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 so if you typically will do what we do, growers doing a spring as they do today, and then they implement our system and start to trust more and more on it. And they don't need to change anything, but check the data regularly or once in a while, right. just to get convinced. It takes some time, seasons, months, past population, generations, uh, et cetera. Uh, so, but, but uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is that in horticulture, growers can, can do crop protection and scouting themselves. Mm. In such environments, that is not allowed. They need to use a provider. So what we see there is that if the end user is not willing to stand up mm -hmm. and the provider is holding back because of its business model, we cannot get in. But the, 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 the end user, let's say that's Buller uh, 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 storing, they need to stand up and take the first step because the provider, well, it's going to be to get through them and, and, and wriggle yourself, uh, yourself in. And so that's a completely different. Well, in a greenhouse, I have a, I have a discussion with a grower on site and I say, I'm interested. Okay, let's hang it. And you do it. I, I just did actually 15, uh, 15 minutes and we're up and running. And, and that's a completely different approach which you have to have to deal with. But it's yeah, still fairly simple, but you have some hurdles to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to overcome. Indeed, that's in the end, ultimately, the question for business uh, plan, isn't it? Who is uh, getting the benefit? Who is paying for it? So exactly. in this yeah. case, mm -hmm. uh, indeed, when you are embedded in the Westland uh, ecosystem, you have a very direct short line with the yeah. end beneficiary who are the, actually the growers. So yeah, and they're also the payer. Yeah, yeah. And in, in yeah. providers, it's like, okay, I now do this and I, I bring that and then I invoice them, uh, the, the end user, the, 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 the warehouse kind of. Um, but yeah, if we automate that, it's going to be much cheaper than how we do it now. So what's the value? How do we invoice that? How do, what kind of value do we put on it? Yeah, and that is, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's something uh, you cannot easily mess with. Uh, <laughs> I think Dick might have some idea to connect you with uh, Bueller to have a discussion, to have at least starting with Pilot, right, Dick? Yes, that, is, that, it would, that would be an idea because how to develop this there is a business proposition here. There's technology to be developed, and there is a business proposition. Moth-free chocolate for vegan young people is a proposition. Yeah. And shouldn't we talk about that, about that to Tony Chocolonely, to Olam, to uh, Continental, et cetera, et cetera? And shouldn't we try to set it up from the from the end buyer, from the consumer? Because yeah. there is an opportunity. It would uh, so it would help the one who stores the cocoa beans. Um, I don't know what the savings are they have to fight the best. I don't know what you can save them. But obviously, there is an end value of, indeed, yeah. as we marketed this, moth-free chocolate. So yeah. shouldn't we come in? This is what we are talking about. And, and uh, Tiffany, Bianca, and I we were just talking about it, how to connect people around this and bring this whole chain together and make up for new business solutions that are commercial solutions paying for sustainability. What do you think about that? Because we are discussing it. And I can see that Sebastian Verbesselt, he's from Ilvo in, in Belgium. They develop technology. Uh, perhaps Sebastian, you can join in this discussion as well. How to make this indeed commercially viable or how to boost it commercially. But Bram, first first to you and Sebastian. Yeah. Um, I, I, I find it interesting in. because yeah because I was thinking about the um, um, yeah the, the, the food in there indeed. And yeah and for people that are vegan, I think it's a very interesting take. They cannot be vegan right now because there's there's nothing left to eat. Yeah? If you if you think about it. And I think that's a really interesting take and, and I really like your idea of working with the end user which is also a little bit more visible. I would say, let's say, if you take Pocket Tony Chocolate only, they are voicing themselves and, and putting pressure on the, on the chain, isn't it? That is what they do. Uh, how they, they, they rattle the cage a little bit. 
I believe that in horticulture, we did actually a little bit the same. We first started with the end growers, got them enthusiastic, and then yeah, potential partners saw it around. And they were like, oh, um, I see more and more stickers, uh, uh, logos. What's going on here? Uh, should we know about this? Growers talk about it. And then they also approached. I, I believe that's a very interesting uh, approach to, to take. Huh? To, to take the end user, which is actually now suffering, that has a proposition, put force on the value chain. Yeah, and the same thing goes for vegan lettuce, for example, or vegan anything, because there's always a caterpillar on it, and you're never sure if you're eating something alive. Yeah, well, it's it's dead by then, but it's still, yeah. <laughs> you're probably yeah. eating it. I hope at least I, uh, well, I, I see a new Tony Chocolonely bar coming up. Uh. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Sebastian has, was there, but he, he left. Okay, he didn't want to be in this discussion. He didn't want to be lured in, but I think there is, I think we should bring people together, for example, to Tony's in Amsterdam and, 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 and have uh, a discussion with the retailer and, and them as a brand and you and Bueller and Olam uh, getting, wrapping our minds around this, how yeah. to bring this technology forward, because that is what you said. The EU as, as the, it's like French lawmaking. It's very, very strict. And then you offer you offer money, and that could do it. Uh, and as I learned from someone from the CGF, the Consumer Goods Forum, uh, uh, bring in a lot of money. People who come up with a real solution, they get the money, and they can they can develop it. I think strategies like that need to be developed. So, if you're into that, Bram, let's try to to develop this and really do it, bringing people together. Yeah, I am into it. I, I never, I mean, I know Jonas is so glowing, but I never followed this approach. So I already got some good ideas and yeah, let's, uh, let's go after it. I, uh, I agree. Wow. You are so enthusiastic and didn't think about <laughs> vegan chocolate as a solution to putting forward your technology. That is. Well, I'm still there. Um, and I, uh, I am still there. Yeah. Okay. I was, uh, suddenly was, everything was frozen. Sorry. Yeah. So I said, I'm, I'm I'm surprised that you never thought about it because you're so enthusiastic. Uh, so let's try and, and set this up. Yeah, yeah good idea. And with Ilvo as well. So uh, he left, but it's interesting. They develop technology uh, in, in, in Belgium. And obviously it's a huge, huge, in the, the, the Flanders is huge in food technology. Yeah, so, maybe he saw threat, uh, threat coming his way. Well, okay, let's get out of here. <laughs> I don't know. He's in drone research, I saw. Oh, cool. That's uh, nice. Now we're all in the same, same interest field. Nice. Yeah. So that's what my two cents, Tiffany. Uh, indeed, let's let's try to set this up. And if there are other questions, I see some room from Czechia. Uh, that, so please... People who don't speak Dutch, join in and join in for a comment. Yeah. Behind somebody? We, have, uh, we hear a lot of noise somewhere. Okay, wow. that's gone. Okay, so I don't know where that come from. But, uh, um, well, if we have uh, no uh, um, other... No, we have no. Quite, sorry. Okay. I think it was uh, promise. Well, if we have uh, no other questions, I think uh, um, we have... Uh, yeah, thank you for everybody for joining today. Uh, and thank you, Bram, for a very passionate and interesting presentation. Um, we learned a lot. I think actually, uh, I don't know if Cora just uh, joining your your screen camera song. Would you like to give us your last comment? You are muted. Yes, I have no special question, but I think uh, to say goodbye, I switch my video on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you uh, learn something today from today's session? Yes, I did. Yeah. And well, I have a question, but I'm not really um, know everything about it. But I just was asking yeah, myself, um, could it be used outside also or only in the greenhouse? 
for the open Drum. field agriculture. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. And I, I think we've lost Brum. Um yeah. he he is he is he back now. Um I know that uh they I, I think they're open, so they're using it in an open field. And what would be interesting is indeed ha if if they can have because what what we just learned is they know uh the amount of of pests growing and they can see them it, it is a very early warning system and i'd like to know if it is as successful in the open fields as it is in-house because in-house obviously it's different from outside yeah. and i'd like to learn that because if it works it is something that is huge in 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 open field uh the use of it can reduce massively the use of pesticides in open fields but we have lost Brom. I think. Mm. Is that Thank correct, you. Bianca? He, we don't, I don't see him in the list anymore. He dropped out. Well, he, he just joined uh, again. Ah, there he is. So oh, here he is again. Yeah. Yes, uh, Bram, we were just discussing with uh, Cora uh, about the application for open field. Obviously, there's an advantage to controlled environment because a lot of things are already controlled, including lighting and amount of pests that could be present. Um, but how would this, uh, or do you know that this development in open field application, yeah. an early warning system? Yeah, yeah. Sorry for uh, my wife. I just stopped, so I need to move to another room. So we're sorry for the delay. Uh, okay. Well, that's a that's a that's a valid question, and uh, we actually see potential outdoors. The, for the drones, it's going to be challenging. Um, as our CTO said five years ago, it's going to take at least. 10 years before we see drones flying, maybe autonomously outside due to legislation. Well, we're five years ahead, not much, not, not, nothing much changed. So maybe it's going to take another 10 years before that happens. And then, of course, you also have to take into mind that just the value per square meter in an orchard, for example, or in arable land is different than in uh, a greenhouse. But if you think at the monitoring solutions, which is already bringing a lot of value, there's a big potential, obviously, uh, because you don't need to see the whole orchard. You need strategic points that say something about first best presence. I mean, in a greenhouse, you have the season, the right season, the whole year round. Eh? In a gerbera greenhouse, for example, or strawberry, if you want. But outside, you can follow the natural trends of the nature, um, of, 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 of insects, of animals, uh, whatever. And so, um, um, yes, the monitoring as we have today, you can put this strategic locations, find the first, let's say, occurrence of a pest and track it over time. And maybe it will be just two, three generations, but it will help to guide them when to start their, yeah, let's say the most optimal control uh, uh, control solutions. Mm -hmm. And we're actually doing some small trials there with uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, growers that like to, uh, yeah, uh, take the lead in that. But I can imagine it's forbidden, maybe, f because of the food for the birds and so on. Uh, for for the, the camera system, you mean? For, for No, the drones are to yeah. be used outside. Well, that, that and then the, the legislation is, is holding us back. So flying drones outside is okay in certain... Uh, if you look at the map, it's uh, not that much because we have so much airports uh, density <laughs> uh, and also uh, where people live in safety. Um, but flying autonomously, uh, there are some let's say ways to do it, but you need still need an operator mon monitoring the drone from a distance. Well, if you have ten in an orchard that need to be checked, and you have one hundred orchards, well. You need an army of people sitting behind screens to do that. Yeah, that's not going to happen. That's not scalable. So drones outside in the way we use them today without an operator, 10 years more, I think. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep them inside where we are good to go. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. No, but it, it's it. That, that is a problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the last uh, insight on this uh, topic. We uh, really learned a lot. And uh, thank you, Bram, really, for a great presentation. Very, very interesting. And uh, we hope we have a follow-up on, on this, on the, on the chocolate. Yeah. No, Dick, we'll, uh, we'll have a call about that. Nice. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, oh, uh, we have, I see... Uh, oh, there's one question. <laughs> yes. Please uh, introduce yourself and... 
Sure. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Guillermo Hanula. I'm from Euler. Maybe it's oh, okay, who thanks. you were talking before. Yeah. But unfortunately, I'm not from the technical part or engineer, so I cannot make much support. I'm from finance. Um, but I really like the, the idea, the use of technology in these things that normally they are not very much the topic. And I will try to reach to the person that invite us to, to make them know about this um, business idea or to, to at least maybe get you in contact um, to be useful yeah. to, to have my time here <laughs> inside the company. So by promising that I will send the email, not sure nice. how far it will get. Are you no, from you the finance? Not. You yes, mean yes, you, yes, yes. you're you're interested in this vegan chocolate, moth-free chocolate? How to develop this with the well, end of uh, the chain? Everyone will be interested in something okay. related to chocolate. Okay, um, uh, but I'm also a data analyst here, and I really like the the use of data and to have information about this. And I love all the the charts that you showed, this fly pattern of the moth. Um, really lovely. I have the technical question that it's about the cleaning of the the propellers because you kill it with it. So I suppose that yeah. from time to yeah. time you need to stop the unit working and, and so on. Yeah, um, uh, it's a good question. Yeah, um, the drones they are very they are the cheapest part of the whole system. Yeah, that's what we did intentionally, and it doesn't mean that we want to replace them every week. We actually have drones that run for two years, and of course they get dirty, but they still perform. Uh, and that is uh, so they're quite uh, quite robust and um, um, the cleaning we actually do not do uh, so that is that is quite interesting because that's that is just maintenance that costs a lot of time which is not really really available and quite a, a precious job you could uh, um, you could say uh, but the for us it's really important that the whole system is robust and that the drone is maybe once in a year, two years replaced. Uh, but there's so little on it that, okay, you can you probably use some parts again uh, and then, yeah, uh, deploy them, uh, deploy them again. Uh, so I think the, the the propellers are maybe one of the things. But if you look at killing a moth of a fly, you don't see any damage. Uh, it's just dirt of the yeah, shreddering that you, uh, that you have. And and I think also important to mention that eh, you saw just a video of the cacao warehouse. Yeah, this is a situation we just want to prevent. We don't want to come in in practice where someone said, I have thousands of these moths flying around. No, we want to be there to start. So we just kill a few so that you don't get to clean a lot, eh, which we now do with fumigation. And I think that is the uh, different perspective of how to solve things by taking the source instead of get tackling the problem when it's when it's there. Yeah, it's like in medicine, palliative medicine or preventive medicine, something like yes. that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can better eat healthy instead of compensate, uh, eating uh, fries every day and try to compensate with sports. That is not really... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the goal, the goal, for, for the replies. The, the goal is even not to kill too many of them. To no. prevent them to <laughs> get into existence. But, but no, yeah. you, need, you really need to get into the circular economy as well. Don't just throw them away, but invent a, uh, a dishwasher for them or something. Otherwise, you're throwing away precious, yeah. not, but, but, but cheap, cheap things. No, okay, I'm no, and I think, no, no, I'm not. That's I'm true. No, no, and you're right. And, and what we do right now, so when we now do we earn a business model, if there's still some time left, we do it as a service model, but we also take responsibility for the hardware. So if something happens, breaks down, we send a new one, they send the old one back, and we 90% of the components can be reused. So let's say our camera box breaks down, the camera breaks down in the camera box. Yeah, but the computer still works and the connectivity and the power, and so we reuse it. And of course, you have to clean it and make sure that you put it in a different environment so that it cannot affect one or the other. But yeah, yeah, that's how we now work because it's yeah a waste of money otherwise and, and and valuable resources okay good it's good to hear that that's important as well thank you but indeed uh let's let's round this up and yes. uh no pun intended by the way um and 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 indeed let's set up a meeting because this is where people data and and technology and business come together and let's this be the first one of what of, well what from the start was our 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 intention bringing it together and making it world commercial yeah. and making That's it work commercially as well 
Yeah, let's do it. I'm uh, I'm up for it. We have a uh, we have to talk about that, uh, Dick. At uh, uh, okay. the coming days. Okay. Nice. Good. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you everyone again. And then we'll Thanks see so. you Thank on the next uh, month yeah. uh, session with uh, right. Let's Grow. Think, right, Dick? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, we know we work with them actually. So, uh, yeah. I think it's, um, I'm not sure. Is it Solidaridad or is it Let's Grow? Um, it's one of the two. Let's Grow or Solidaridad? It's Solidaridad. Okay. It's Solidaridad. So we can start from the chocolate cocoa growing from the farmers, then to the storage, and to then to the consumers. Then you can Indeed. have the whole chain. Indeed, and what is very important about Solidaridad, everyone is talking about uh, the new reporting rules by the EU on scope three, and scope three is the farmer's end of the story. And that is where they start. So Solidaridad is doing something very important, emancipating the farmer with his scope three uh, obligations, and uh, they shouldn't get them on their heads from retailing, processing, etc. down, but they have to send it up to be an equal partner. So that is what we'll be talking about next time. Okay. Have everyone have a good afternoon and see you soon again. Bye.